Hello, I'm Tiffany Hicks, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. As we watch another summer fade, it's time for many of our salmon anglers to get excited about some great coho fishing in the weeks ahead. You don't need a lot of equipment to participate in one of the most popular Puget Sound fisheries. September is coho month. From CQ to San Juans, from Port Townsend down to Olympia, we have our highest catch of coho in the month of September in all of our marine areas. It's the time of the year they start to migrate back to their streams to spawn. They're coming through all of these fishing areas and it's just a great time to be out on the water. It's a little cooler. Fall setting in. It's a wonderful time to be out chasing coho in Puget Sound. We're out here today in CQ and it's a real nice morning. The, the water's fairly calm and there's a lot of other boats out here that are really small. There might be 14, 16 footers and uh, the protected waters of Puget Sound allow people with the smaller boats to get out and enjoy the wonderful salmon resource we have. You don't need a big 40-foot yacht. You can come out and be safe. And as long as you watch the weather, have a, just a, a blast fishing for coho in the smaller boats. I'm used to seeing the fry in the streams. I'm like, wow, this is like a real fish. <laughs> Today we've been basically just trolling cut plug herring. We've just got a, a two to four ounce mooching sinker, about a five to six foot leader with two hooks. Um, make sure they're barbless hooks. And we're just feeding them out about 30 poles behind the boat and trolling. We're varying our speed, trying to go a little faster, a little slower. Make sure you've got a good spin to your herring. It doesn't have to be a particularly elegant spin. But just make sure it's uh, spinning and flashing and that flash is what's attracting the fish. And then it seems like every time you change speed or kind of turn a little bit and you get a little variability in that spin, that's when the co are smacking them. Uh, so these fish are pretty, pretty close to the surface. They're probably less than 20 or 30 feet down. And it's early in the morning, so we're able to fish with this light gear. It's kind of nice. We don't have any downriggers out. It's just you and the fish. It's easier to get your other rods in and then just enjoy the fight of the fish. It's really a neat way to fish when you can. One of the realities of our ability to fish today is, is we have to deal with what we call selective fisheries. And in those fisheries, we may have to release wild fish. It's uh, one of the realities of living with ESA listed fish or our agreements with Canada. Um, what we want to do is, is look for fish that are adipose fin clip. Those are our hatchery fish. The only way that we're going to be able to access some of those fish today and into the future is if we carefully release the wild fish that we catch, those that have an adipose fin. So we really need anglers to take really gentle care of those wild fish. We want them to release them over the side of the boat. We don't want to bring them in the boat and flop them around on the floor. Use a good soft cotton net or a rubber net if you have to put them in a net. If they've swallowed the hooks, just cut the leader and let them go. But the future of our fisheries depends on taking care of those wild fish that we release. And hopefully down the road some point we'll be able to fish on those wild fish again. But right now, it's uh, pretty much limited to the hatchery fish. I haven't fished in a very long time, and it was kind of nice to feel it tugging around and just, I don't know, worried about it coming loose or crackering it. That was pretty fun. And just, the, I like I said before, just to see the big guys, I'm just used to seeing the little fingerlings and the fry and stuff swimming around in streams and at hatcheries, and it was nice to see a full-grown coho. It's beautiful. Washington salmon fishing is not limited to Puget Sound or the coast. Check out this recent Upper Columbia River Chinook fishery where you usually don't need rain gear but should take along the sunscreen. We just opened this uh, fishery uh, again about five years ago, five years ago after quite a lapse in a season. And that first year there were about 20 boats out here on opening day five years ago. This last year on opening day a couple months ago we had over 250 boats. So it's been quite a boon to the economy. It's really brought uh, the public, um, more made them more aware of the fact that what salmon recovery can mean 
to a local community and the economy. It certainly made a difference here, and uh, people are really getting behind salmon recovery and understanding the meaning, uh, you know, a personal meaning behind recovery. And that, that equates not just to dollars coming in the community, but um, have, you, have you seen the uh, people out fishing? These summer Chinook is what we're fishing, and um, they're not listed up here. They're not a listed species under the Federal Endangered Species Act. As a matter of fact, they're one of the few species in the Upper Columbia that aren't listed. The, uh, but they have the fact that there's been a number of improvements in uh, the, the dams, the hydro systems on the Columbia River, and uh, some of the recovery efforts we're doing for other species has definitely had a benefit, a positive impact for the summer Chinook. So although not, uh, not actually listed under ESA, uh, they are reaping some of the benefits of um, improved passage and uh, improved habitat. Weather wise out, I mean, it's like this most of the time. I mean, it's, I think I've only been blown off up here one time this year, which is great. Most of the time, you got to put the top up in order to get, stay a little bit cooler. <laughs> and these fish are pretty nice. I mean, they're in range anywhere from 8 to 45 pounds, has been the biggest one so far. Very enjoyable up here. No seasickness. The, the fish hit hard and they fight good. And I don't know what else you can say about them. <laughs> Washington's charter fleet has had a busy summer. You'd think any of the charter crews would view each trip as routine, but that's not always the case, especially when there are young clients on board. There are a lot of people that. Uh, own their own boats and go fishing two or three times a week during the salmon season and a lot of those folks got started because they went on a charter boat once. Maybe their dad took them or maybe they came uh, uh, out with a relative or something and that was their first experience and that got them started salmon fishing here in the northwest. There's nothing more exciting if you're a charter boat skipper than watching a kid catch his first salmon. And you know kids go out there they don't know what to expect. Maybe they caught a trout that weighed uh, I don't know eight ten ounces or maybe even a couple of pounds. And all of a sudden they've tied into something that weighs 10, 12, 14, maybe even 20 pounds. And this is an experience of a lifetime. I caught two salmon, two rockfish, and two cod. And my mom helped me a little with the salmon. 25, 10, that is. It's a great experience and it's their first opportunity uh, at fishing and Usually when they have a good time on that first trip, they're, they're stuck for life. They're gonna be fishing all their life. It's exciting to show you a great success story this month. The agency has been trying to bring back the western pond turtle through a captive breeding program, and it's working. We're out here at South Puget Sound Wildlife Area where we have attempted to reestablish western pond turtles, a species that once flourished around South Puget Sound but dwindled to the point where there were none just uh, as recently as 15 years ago. These ponds we took advantage of Pierce County who dug ponds on Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife property and in these ponds, the year after they were dug, we put turtles and the turtles have thrived such that they've laid eggs for the past three years. And two of those nests produced 13 little hatchling turtles last year, all of which have been in the zoo for the past year and were today released at uh, about 80 to 100 grams in size, about uh, the size of a hardball. We're extremely encouraged with the pond turtle reestablishment program because we've had good survival, good growth, and we've had animals live here in the wild all the way up to reprodu reproduction and successfully producing uh, the next generation. We've got a new site that we're going to put turtles in next summer and some more that we're looking at. You know, within five, ten years, I think we could have as many as six or a dozen sites where we have pond turtles and hopefully they'll all do as well there as they, they've done here. You know, for me, having western pond turtles here in western Washington is a way of sort of respecting what this part of our nation had in the past, its heritage, 
the components of the wildlife community that were important at one time and that we can continue to maintain as an important part of the wildlife community if we just respect it and do what's needed to conserve it. Um, they're a harmless animal, they're a cute animal, they're an animal that many people appreciate and I think just from that standpoint providing them for people to uh, see and enjoy and just know that they're around is, is a good thing. We've also got efforts to understand another dwindling species, the Oregon spotted frog, and we're working on understanding them better so that we know where we might reintroduce them and get new populations started so that that endangered species will be secure and can be taken off our list. Here's where to see some of Washington's wildlife during the coming weeks. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can keep Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching, and please join us again.